Welcome to another virtual Live Talks Los Angeles event. We welcome Seth Rogen and Evan Goldberg to our series. We invite you to visit and subscribe to our YouTube channel for over 300 conversations, sort of like this. Follow <laughs> us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our handle is Live Talks LA. Seth Rogen's book is Yearbook. I am Ted Haptigaber, founder and producer of the series. I would let Evan take it from here. All right. Hi, Seth. Hi, lovely, Evan. Lovely to see you again. Good to see you again. How's it going, man? It, it's funny to not confront that, like, we're on a Zoom before this, and we'll be on a Zoom after this together, but this Zoom's a little different. No, it's true. I asked you to do this, and, and then the second after, I was like, this, it, it, this is like the most awkward person to have do this because we know each other so well, so doing anything formal is so strange, but I like that, and I think we should expose ourselves to it every once in a while. <laughs> uh, I mean, it seems like an easy way to talk about the book, though, and an actual, uh, it, it is good that it's me because I haven't read the book, but no. I'm probably in many of the stories. I'm you sure. had to legally clear yourself for usage in a lot of it, though. So. I did. <laughs> checking as to what I was clearing it for so I hope you haven't screwed me here too bad <laughs> I have not well I talk I mean and and I thought what could be nice is for us to kind of reminisce on the stories that I wrote about that involve you which is a lot of the stories in the book um but what I talk about in the book is uh, is is the bar mitzvah year which I think to me, and I assume you, was one of like the craziest years of my entire life and always will be, right? Be yeah, I mean, because you, we met, I mean, we met in bar mitzvah class, but for those of you who are not, who did not grow up with us specifically, um, the year you go to bar mitzvah class and then you're invited to the bar and bat mitzvahs of everyone you're in class with, which is enough to occupy essentially a bar but mitzvah every single weekend for an entire year. Well, I, and like, I, I didn't go to, I went to a, a not to a public school and I went to an after school Jewish school. So I had half the amount of bar mitzvahs and bat mitzvahs that you had. And it was still, I remember it was in the high thirties. I went to like 38 bar mitzvahs in one year. How many did you go to a hundred? Yeah, something, honestly, yes. I think I went to around a hundred <laughs> and, and it was, it was crazy for a lot of reasons. And like, <laughs> one thing I talk about is like, it was the first time I kind of ever had to decide what I wanted to wear, ever. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have that problem. I had one suit my mom got me from Costco and that was what I wore. <laughs> you had 90s, big 90s shoulder pads. <laughs> yeah, wait, I do feel like you were the same, like green, was it like a forest green? <laughs> like <laughs> it, was, it was a nice suit. I liked it. It was my bar mitzvah suit. It was like something you would see Jay Leno wearing, maybe on like uh, on a good day. Yeah. On a good day, it kind of had a shine to it, a nice yeah. subtle shine. When to I look it. back on the bar mitzvah. The crazy thing about it is, it's like a outrageously crazy social experiment. You're like thrown into these like intense scenarios where it's like you, you're stuck with the guy who doesn't like you. You're beside the girl that does like you. The girl who likes you that you don't. I made it sound like a lot of girls liked me right there. That yeah. <laughs> Here was mostly me, Seth, and Fogel goofing around. Yeah. Well, like, one thing I talk about is, and do you, I don't know if you remember this, but um, a phenomenon that happened at Bar Mut Mitzvahs. I was trying to remember like the songs that were most popular at our Bar Mut Mitzvahs. Cotton Eye Joe. Cotton Eye Joe is the first one that comes to mind. And 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 I actually bought that album, the Red Nexus entire album, um, and it it's not good. Um, <laughs> but there's one other song that's all right, but I can't remember the name. It's called Pop in an Oak, and it just sounds exactly like Cotton Eye Joe. <laughs> um, and, and another song that I remember, and I'm sure you remember this phenomenon. I, I'm going to be profane during this live talk, I hope. I, I, I've told them that I will be smoking pot. Uh, we will both be smoking weed and, and swearing throughout this live talk, so I hope that is okay with, with the live talk attendees. Um, one, thing that, uh, one thing that happened... I remember, and I'm sure you remember, is uh, they would play the Billy Idol song, Monet, Monet. Oh, yeah. And, <laughs> and the song, and you fill in the part that, I, that I'm thinking of. Billy Idol would go, here she there. comes now singing Monet, Monet. And then every kid would scream. Get laid, get lost. No, they'd say, hey, motherfucker, get laid, get fucked. <laughs> and the song get fucked? Yeah. <laughs> it was hey motherfucker get laid get fucked and i don't know why they scream that and i and i actually did a lot of research to find out 
where that came from. Like, why? <laughs> well, so I did look it up. I, I found that Billy Idol there. So again, just to clarify, what would happen is Billy would go, here she comes now singing Moni Monet, and then every kid would scream, hey, motherfucker, get laid, get fucked. And then it's like, turn around, Monet. hey, motherfucker, get laid, get fucked. What I found was an interview with Billy Idol where he talks about it, and he says that it came from British frat houses in the 1980s. So how it wound up, <laughs> but but that's it. And I have no idea how. how and it Britain are aligned in the Commonwealth. Do you need more than that? I think there's a Commonwealth. Uh, there's clearly a Commonwealth connection. Play rugby. It makes sense. To me. It's true. We played rugby and we screamed, "Hey, motherfucker, get laid, get fucked!" Which British frats? I didn't know they had frats in Britain. Never mind ones that came up with the song. They have fraternities in the UK. Um, Another thing I talked about is like uh, in my head, a thing that we used to do a lot, and maybe one of the first things that we bonded over at Bar and Bat Mitzvahs, which is cutting open glow sticks and slathering ourselves with the insides. Yeah, which is which is very healthy. There's no uh, negative chemical re repercussions from that. Oh man, my kids want every time there's a glow stick, they want to crack it open and play with it so bad, and I want to let them, but no. I, is it dangerous? I don't know. <laughs> It's it has to be colorful. I, I like as a dad now having to like serve my kids not garbage food like I ate. Anything really colorful is just bad. <laughs> so something glowing is not good. Yeah, I would not, admit. Not the best. And now remembering all of them, they give out like blow up guitars, little blow up guitars, headbands. The other crazy thing that I always think about is like our bar mitzvahs in the west coast of Canada were very tame compared to the bar mitzvahs the other Jews in the world were having that I am the most American Jew. Yes, we did not have crazy bar mitzvahs on the grand scale of things, but I would say we became friends through going through to bar and bat mitzvahs, basically, right? Yeah, I mean, essentially, like I would go to my after school, like two hours of school, and I would see Seth leaving. I would see you leaving your Jew school, and I like knew you, but I didn't know you as a friend. And then, yeah, we, we did tell us to fill in for Sunday mornings for two hours. You learned tell us is like the, uh, the the white robe that you put on when they pray. <laughs> And knowing that you got to go pretty deep into the Jew and the little boxes, the little those yes, the, I don't know how to explain that. You, you have to I don't, I, I don't, a box with a scroll on your head and <laughs> on your arm. So um, you got to learn that. So then we, after the next year, I write about how we, we go into high school. Um, and basically, I talk about how like 7 Eleven is where it all went down. Like, and I kind of, I describe it as kind of like the bar in like a Western movie where like, it's kind of like where everyone is, but it's also very dangerous. But uh, uh, do you remember yeah, it being like, like, like a soda shop, but you're right. There was an element of danger. Like kids were stealing things. Kids were needing to do nefarious things. All, most of the worst, all, all the worst things that happened to me happened there. <laughs> Every time I got in a fight or beat up, it was there. <laughs> but we went there all the time. And I, I get in the book, I, I, I talk about how like I would always look at those Western bars in Western movies and be like, why do people hang out there? Like, yeah, why you're, you're, <laughs> you're going to get fucking shot. But at the same time, we, I get it. It's because there's nowhere else to go. We would go to 7-Eleven all the time, even though it was a very dangerous place for us to be. <laughs> man, I always think about, man, what was the guy's name who worked there? The, the two people that that like 40 year old woman and that 30 year old guy oh man i just their lives i can't even imagine um, erlinda and yeah bob or russ or something yeah, erlinda was right they yeah were living in like uh like yeah they were living in this old saloon where it's anything i remember one time i think it was jamie uh, someone stole the nacho cheese dispenser one day <laughs> someone just grabbed it and just ran like holding the whole thing and they did not get away, but they tried. <laughs> yeah, I faked a seizure once, creating cover for people to steal a bunch of other shit from the shelves. Um, and then I got banned for like one month in the wake of that, which is like pretty... The weird thing is that they knew it. Like it wasn't like you were a kid going, they'd be like, Seth, what are you doing? I'm going to tell your teacher. I know you. I see you every day. <laughs> it's true it was a hard environment to really pull off like a great crime in um another thing i write about and i'm curious what your memory of this is is so when i was around 
uh, 13, I started doing stand-up comedy. And then um, I got a job writing jokes for a moil who came and picked me up after school one day in like a Ferrari. <laughs> I, I, recall, I recall these events. I mean, we all thought you were going to die or something. I yes, exactly. And that is, and that is. <laughs> Very, you know, the odds of a moil being a serial killer are very low, but you got into a strange man's car and drove away. So it didn't break. Are the odds of him being a serial killer low? Because at the same time, like, this is a guy who's dedicated his life to, like, using a scalpel to cut little kids' dicks off. <laughs> he has a code that he follows. Inside of that code, that is permissible, but not many nefarious things are. <laughs> yeah, but I... I remember like him picking me up in his, in his Ferrari, like thinking it was going to be cool. And then all of you looking at me, like it was like the opening of mystic river. And I was about to be like, take it off and never, never to be returned the same way again. <laughs> who, who put you in touch with the model? Like, how did you, I don't remember how you came to be in a car with this model. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I was doing stand-up comedy and the Moyle came up to me after a show and gave me his card. It wasn't a friend of your mom's friend or something? Nope. Oh, it, was, it was a Moyle who sought me out after a show and gave me his card and was like, I want you to write jokes for my Moyle act. Um, and I'd never been to a circumcision also, so I had no, fuck, I had no fucking clue what <laughs> A happenstance. I went to my first circumcision only a year and a half ago. My whole life, I've never seen a, a brisk. It might have been the same moil. No, this was in LA, the first one. I then it was not the same moil. <laughs> <laughs> my moil got so good with these jokes, he became famous and started. <laughs> on where the moil is at? He's still in Vancouver and he still tells the jokes I wrote. Really? Yes. I compliment. It is a high compliment. Um, another thing I talk about in the book is how we would get drunk uh, in high school um, as much as we humanly could, essentially. It was pretty aggressive. I was driving by um, the wine store, like right behind Tom and Tora in that like plaza. And I had a vision yesterday as I was picking up my kids of us going there with like, Julia and Lauren, I think before a dance at Beth Israel or something like that. Yes. Two liter bottles of growers uh, cider. I totally remember that too. <laughs> like two liters of cider each because we were like, there's a unit of cider to consume. <laughs> and I remember that was like an obscure enough little liquor store that it felt like they would sell to us. Like, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if this is in the book, but one of the funniest parts of our childhood going back to my four to three bar mitzvah suit is Seth and I have not aged well from the beginning of our lives. And due to that have one benefit, which is we looked older than the other kids. And we're also both six feet tall. And so we, and we could, if we didn't shave for a while, we had like dirty little mustaches we could get going. So we would not shave for like a week and then put on our suits and then go buy liquor. And we would like do a thing where I'd be like, man, the boss of the office is really grinding me lately. Like, I oh, can't believe we're here on our lunch break from our work jobs. And it worked. From our adult work jobs. Yeah. Uh, well, one thing I do write about, and you are actually the star of this story in a lot of ways, is Arts County Fair. Oh, yeah. I was the star of that. <laughs> and well, I actually found, and just to give some context on this story through doing research, um, Arts County Fair was, I don't think it's still happening, the biggest student run event in North America. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't either, which there was no bigger undertaking that was purely in the hands of kids, essentially. <laughs> Now that I'm like looking back on the, you know what? They're good at it. <laughs> they are good at it. They got a lot and, done, but the, so, the guidance over alcohol was low. Yeah. So what Arts County Fair was to our lovely live talk listeners was a giant, um, it was a, it was a, it was a, a, essentially a fundraiser for the arts department of UBC, which um, uh, was the local, uh, the college in British Columbia. And what the event was, was a giant beer garden that was held in a outdoor field hockey stadium. And they would have bands perform throughout the day and shit like that, but it was mostly an outdoor beer garden. And the, the thing about it was though, <laughs> is 
you gained entrance to the beer garden by getting a stamp on your hand. Just they would put a stamp on your yeah, hand. Show your ID to get the stamp. We, we, you just show your idea to get the stamp. But once you have the stamp, no one questioned anything. Uh, they turned a blind eye, I would say. <laughs> um, and it was it was off. Like no one was checking anything. No one gave a shit. And what we found is that if you went up to someone with a stamp and licked your hand and just pressed it up against their stamp, the stamps were very easily transferable from one person to another. Just going like two or three times, and it literally there was a code for it. You just go up to someone and say "lick stamp," and they go, "Uh huh." Uh -huh. Yeah, and you just go up to an older person. And you'd ask, and they would always oblige because that they didn't give a fuck. And you would press your hand against theirs. And when I say that, let's say there was two, let's say there was five thousand people at this event. It feels like it was half people under the age of fifteen, <laughs> and and the rest over the age of fifteen. We skipped school. If you were like, we left school at like we didn't even like we left at like eight thirty in the morning. <laughs> I remember there was like twelve of us walking away from my house. We we didn't want my parents to find out how much liquor we were stealing, so we filled a one liter bottle of empty clearly Canadian with one one shot of scotch, one shot of vodka, one shot of gin, one shot of tequila, and made uh, probably the worst drink ever. And we walked to the bus and bust on down while sharing this giant, disgusting bottle of booze. Yeah, we took the bus there first thing in the morning <laughs> and um, proceeded to drink all day at Arch County Fair. Um, oh, well, one other thing is uh, you get a cup and the tradition is you get two cups. They're like plastic cups with handles and then what everyone does is they clip them to their belts so that they have because without the mug if you lose your mug you can't get more beer so everyone's running around with these mugs bouncing on their hips no matter what they're doing and uh i lost uh everyone i ate a weed cookie that a counselor from my summer camp gave me and then i lost everyone um dave robins um i actually ate that too and oh yes we both ate it um <laughs> You had never smoked weed, but you ate this weed cookie. Um, and <laughs> I lost you. I didn't know where you were. And the next, so most kids from our school probably were going to arrive around 1 p.m. or 2 p.m. That's when I found you. You had been removed from the venue. You were kicked out. You were sitting outside of the front gate of the venue and the timing was unfortunate because it was right as most of the people from our high school were actually showing up to the event. So it was a few hundred people that knew you standing in line watching as you had been kicked out of the venue. And you were sitting in a folding plastic chair just with your head in your hands, just throwing up all over the place. <laughs> well, I remember all of it. I remember all of it, no matter how messed up I was. And I remember thinking, like, this is a bummer. This might define uh, all of us for a long time. <laughs> this might not be something that we shed easily. This might be, um, you know, our cross to bear, I guess. And then it got worse um, when uh, some people in a stretcher show, or so, so when two paramedics showed up holding a stretcher <laughs> um, to load you onto. Um, and they did, they got you on the stretcher. And I remember everyone again from our high school just being like, like this fucking mother, this poor motherfucker. <laughs> like no, this, this is a sad state of affairs. Um, kind of strong in the end. yes, you do. They, they started to carry you away on the stretcher at which point you sprung up, um, <laughs> as though you were like jolted awake by electricity or something. Um, you leapt off the stretcher, you shoved a paramedic aside and screamed, I need more beer as you ran uh, down the line of people. And then you hopped the fence back into the beer garden. You grabbed a mug from someone and you disappeared. Uh, huh? I went to the beer line. You went back to you got back. You <laughs> did indeed. I got back to the beer line. I had to hold onto the fence to not fall down. And then I don't know if this is in your story, but my day did end with the same security guards refinding me and chasing me out of the venue. Uh, <laughs> and then, 
And then a weird little button is I jumped into a bush to get away from them. And one of our friends was in that bush. Uh, Nick, uh, Nick Boone, I think was his name. And he was just in the bush also hiding because he too had to run out for some other, I never got the full story. <laughs> it was a popular bush. Uh, yeah, <laughs> most messed up I've ever been in my life, I would say. Like, like the only time I was put on a stretcher. Yeah, that, I, uh, it, it, it sounds messed up. Um, another thing I talk about a little bit is doing karate, which you did with me. Um, and that we slowly discovered we were, we were the bad guys in karate. Yeah, we were like Cobra Kai for sure. <laughs> I mean, the number one move was a kick to the groin. They really like, you know, when you send a kid to karate, you think like, oh, they're going to learn to like defend themselves. But they taught us more so how to just like beat people up. Yeah. It was really, real rough and tumble. It was weird. It was at the JCC, and so it seemed very benign, but it was at the JCC because I think their proper dojos uh getting shut down or something like that. They would not accept our, they would not accept our school of karate. <laughs> we were found to be too, uh, uh, yeah, we were found to be too abhorrent for them. Um, um, uh, there's other good stories you were there for, and one that I'm sure you remember maybe more clearly is the time we met George Lucas. Oh, yes. Was, was I see that more as the time I met Steven Spielberg, but uh, who I've only met once and you've met more times. I met both of them once in that moment, and that was the, yeah, that was like the confluence of madness that you're hoping for when you go to Hollywood, just to <laughs> see the two of them just as a friends also <laughs> what's funny though is i i've told this story a few times and like and is referred to now that it's in my book and every time it's like followed up by a, a little parenthetical that says representatives from george lucas deny this story <laughs> but um yeah the story is uh that me and you were were called in to meet steven spielberg which was thrilling right like yeah, one of the best things that ever happened and um, like, you know, I think we knew that like he was going to pitch us something that we probably weren't going to do. Like it, it seemed very vague. It was just a general meeting. It was kind of a general meeting. I didn't, I, like I, I didn't think like we're going to walk out of here working with Steven Spielberg necessarily, but I was hoping. No, but never. <laughs> that took around 10 years. Um, but uh, yeah, so we're waiting in his office and um, yeah, and then the craziest fucking thing ever happens, which is Steven Spielberg comes into the room with George Lucas, which is crazy. Like, it doesn't happen, you know? Um, Shocker. I was, like, reeling from the fact that I was talking to Steven Spielberg. I couldn't even deal with the fact that, yeah, seeing them together, it's also like, what is the last thing they did together? Yeah, exactly. That was part of it. I was, it was like, are we witnessing a thing that never happens? Like, yeah, or, but the way they were so casual and buddy buddy, like it might happen twice a week. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, and then what happened? So Stephen then starts kind of, from my memory, like maybe answering emails or taking a few phone calls or something like that. But like I remember, he kind of sat at his desk and was like doing something else. Someone came in. It, it was he was like lightly pitching us something, some collaboration, and then he had to deal with something. But George was there, so he like he was very politely just like, "Oh, you guys chat for a second. Yeah, exactly. It was kind of like you talk to George while I uh, have to deal with this thing. Unfortunately, um, at which point George Lucas. Uh, started to explain to us that, so this was in early 2012 probably, um, that he thought in it was December, right, that ultimately it was all supposed to happen, but he thought I think in December of 2012 um, that the world was going to end. Um, the world was going to end. There was going to be a massive shift in the very nature of the physical makeup of the world and certain parts of it were going to slide into the ocean. Um, on the San Andreas fault line, I believe, was the concept. <laughs> that was the concept. I just bonked my head on my desk from nodding to it. He was trying try to help us. He was like, get a place on the other side of the fault line. Yeah, he very much seemed... And, and this, it wasn't like... It wasn't like no one was saying this. I would say, like, um, probably if you believed in Y2K, I would argue you believed in that this was going to happen, maybe. It was very matter of fact. He was just like, oh, this will happen. He said it with an amazing amount of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> that I never thought would happen. But after that, I was like, pretty smart guy. 
Yeah. Well, it was like, he said it with such confidence. Yeah, I was like, are we wrong? Are we the ones who are wrong? <laughs> is this, did, is he right about this? It seems like he, he might be. Everything. He added like CG animals to most Eisley that don't make sense. He's made mistakes. <laughs> he really has. But um, yeah, and then, and he, and I, he implied that he had a spaceship was also a part of the conversation that I remember. Remember, I, there was something, it was like a, a, a bunker or a space <laughs> or something. He had a contingency plan of some sort. Man, one Would, day he's going to be sitting in whatever it is. Being like, Those stupid well, I always think that I remember, like, I, I, I bet at the, I bet on December 2012, he was in whatever it was waiting for it to happen. And it, when it didn't, it was, it was probably pretty awkward. <laughs> well, well, it just didn't happen for me. <laughs> um, man, uh, I talk about the interview a little bit in my book. You were very involved in that. Uh, one thing that I still remember is having to get security and then getting security taken from us. Um, that's something. Yeah. Both were unblessed <laughs> with achieving it and losing it. <laughs> it is one of those things where like you don't know that you want it until it's gone um so yeah like in the wake of the film the interview uh we were you know there was thought maybe we would be assassinated by um the north korean government i guess is that why they gave us a, do you think that's no. why no, no 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 i got i got deep into it with them they were just like this is just in case someone who like you know this is for america this is in case some American wants to like be on the news because this is the number one story right now and just a general precaution. I, I really, I think it was just so that they could say they did it and did all the safe things because it was Sony who paid for it and all that. Yeah, you're probably right. It would have just looked bad if we got killed, I would imagine. Um, but yeah, so we had security. It was armed security, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, like... Was your guy my, my, was your guy just like sitting in your living room couch basically like mine was or they were in their cars outside they were in their cars outside because they had to watch what was going down yeah, yeah. I had two different guys they were always out front I remember I would bring them I couldn't eat my dinner without bringing them some food because I felt really weird about it and then they clearly were like no one does this and it felt really weird that I kept bringing them food but I was just like you're just sitting in your car and they're like this is what I do man I'm good and I would always go out to check on the guy just to make sure he's cool. Yeah, and the guy, I remember the guy one day, he was like, I was just like in Iraq, like sitting in my car watching a movie on my laptop. Like, this yeah. is not bad. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, they were the type of dudes where I was like, these, are, these guys are legit. Like, I am, I am glad to have that man watching my back right now. No, it was, it, it, but at the same time, it was incredibly um, alarming, you know, to have someone there like watching us all the time you know it was not cool i mean there was i remember when i was told they were going to send security i was uh directing uh for, with joseph gordon levitt uh, an episode of hit record and i heard it happening as as i was like prepping a shot and i was like just the thought that like my wife was home and i wasn't there and that this was happening like messed me up real bad there was it was like 24 hours where i was like a complete mess about that stuff yeah and then, and then what's funny is that I write about also is like, so we had them for a few weeks, maybe. And they really made it seem important that we had them. And it was like a life change to have them. Like they didn't seamlessly fold into how we lived our lives by any means, you know? Uh, we're not, talk to my neighbors and be like, so you'll notice a man who looks like you. Yeah, like we're not, we're not security people in general. And then one day I woke up, I went downstairs, I looked outside and he was gone. <laughs> Did you have that exact same experience? I, I, I was like, the guy's gone, the guy's gone. Uh, of them right away. <laughs> I feel like we called each other. It was like, is your guy gone? I was like, oh, my guy's gone. I know. And like going back to my like need to feed, uh, I was like, I, I like didn't get to give him a cookie for the road or something. I didn't get to give him that one last bite. <laughs> didn't get to send him off with anything but what's weird is they we were never told anything there was no phone call or email or text that's message that's why i'm sure it was they were just like we need to do this for if we do it for two weeks and then something happens one of them will be fine it was just like 
covering the bases. But what's also funny is they were never like, we're going to do this for two weeks. They were like, you need security. And then one morning, the guy was just not there anymore. <laughs> and, it was, and there was no follow-up where it's like, you don't need security anymore. It was more just like, you no longer have security. <laughs> you, you, may, you may still need security. We are just no longer providing you with security. <laughs> Um, and then I all of a sudden felt very much like I needed security, but uh, have have since not had it, luckily. <laughs> Thank God. Um, but man, that whole interview shit was a nightmare, wasn't it? Well, now we finally know the answer. For all this time, the question has been like, was it the North Koreans? Who exactly was it? Was it them and some Russians? What is it, so, was it a Sony employee? For years, everyone's been flipping and flopping, and it, it has come in this year that it was North Korean hackers. And uh, we now know that. I don't think they, are, it's unsure if they're like government hackers, but there are three notorious North Korean hackers who are technically like the world's biggest bank robbers who have stolen money from like other countries and stuff. And uh, that's what it was. Did they profit from it? Um, I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's also like there's, you know, there's no, it's so hard to tell. We'll never know everything, but like there's corporate espionage. Like people. Do someone else could have. Yeah, like other company could have paid or government to like hurt that company, which hurts certain governments. Warner Brothers did it. Yeah, it's Paramount Plus. <laughs> Paramount Plus, Plus is dummy. <laughs> get ahead. I can't believe everyone is just throwing a plus on it. Disney Plus, Paramount Plus. Paramount, yeah. like, Disney Plus exists. You can't just be Paramount Plus. That's a that's a sidebar. We'll get to that. No, that's actually a chapter in my book. <laughs> and I remember something I write about in the book that is uh, one of my most visceral memories from the whole interview experience was being at the premiere, um, like incredibly high on MDMA <laughs> as I was brought into a bathroom and shown on a, a cell phone with you, a, a visual effect shot of Kim Jong-un's head blowing up that was like supposed to be a new version of the shot. And I remember there was just a moment where I was like, I'm on drugs in the bathroom at a movie premiere being shown a shot for the finale of the film on, on the cell phone of Sony's visual effects supervisor. <laughs> he did so many passes on that shot. <laughs> That was a night, that, that was maybe the low point for me. I mean, maybe terrible. not the low point, but that was a bummer. Terrible night. That was a truly awful evening in my life. It was a weird night. It's weird to celebrate something that you're not happy how it's going. <laughs> sure, it sure was. It feels very counterintuitive to have a giant celebration in the in honor of something that is currently a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> swell of people supporting it but it was like just a weird mishmash of patriotism it was very strange i know we got co-opted by like we we became our, like a right-wing cause which was yeah, uh, which was alarming <laughs> you never want to be that <laughs> always alarming hey i was happy to bring people together <laughs> there was one brief moment where everyone could agree that they wish the movie was better <laughs> <laughs> let me find some other things that evan was uh Guess this why what was like like i know the title of your book but like is it just definitive like childhood stuff that really is the thematic through line like is it just like no in there from your 30s or is it just young in your kind of formative years uh no, there are things, I mean, I talk about the interview, so um, yeah, so there is, it's more in a very literal, uh, it, it's more like a yearbook in that, like, it's something that kind of marks these different uh, phases, but it's also the name of one of the chapters, so I literally just was like, oh, that seems like a good name. It's like most things, Evan, as you know, titles are not our strong suit. It's not. <laughs> no, the only title that we have that we agree is super bad, and David Krimmel told us to do that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I would be lying if I pick a good title. That's a good does pick a good title. Uh, Pineapple Express is a good title, but I also would be lying if I didn't say I partially reverse engineered the title from how I imagined the cover looking. Um, like I, I pictured a cover that kind of looked like a yearbook cover um, with drawings of people that I know. Um, and. Uh, 
And so, yeah, I kind of like that idea. Um, I can go through the cover. You're on the cover. Oh, I've seen it. You, yeah. you made the cover. I'm the a tiger. Little, I'm a little balder than when you captured my estimate. It's true. You had this little island of hair when we I, did the cover. <laughs> I do, but I've had to start shaving it back a bit because it's like too sparse now. My island's going. You're getting the hairline. I'm going to be, uh, what's his face from the Flash Gordon soon? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the tiger do you, is, a, is a thing I write about, actually. The guy. The, the oh, heat the tiger made... That was, like, upon looking back, like, what the hell happened there? How did that happen? How did that guy get there? What a strange experience. We were stupid. That was our fault. We yeah. were the producers and directors oh, of the yeah. film. We messed up. We, yeah, like that was that was not a, a high point in our career. We made <laughs> that was very dumb of us. It was dumb. Um, so the story in the book we weren't good enough at filmmaking to understand it was unnecessary, and even if it was necessary, we shouldn't have done it. <laughs> yeah. So in the in, in the scene in the interview, there's a scene where I uh, am sneaking through a field, and I. Uh, we read that in North Korea, there's tigers. So we thought, oh, it could be funny if I uh, encounter a tiger. Um, and in the scene, I kind of am crawling and then I see the tiger and we kind of have this standoff and then the tiger charges me and then a missile falls from the sky and kills the tiger. Um, and it's funny, like, yes, just describing it now, there is, so first we were like, we'll get a CG. Right, we'll uh, <laughs> it's so stupid. We First we're like, we'll get a CG tiger. Which we couldn't afford. Well, so Life of Pi had just come out, and the pinnacle of Tiger CG effects was achieved, and we quickly found out we couldn't. Afford. We just couldn't afford it. It was it was way too expensive, um, and so we found a guy with a tiger. And there is also a real tiger in Life of Pi here and there, and this was the guy who had that tiger apparently. Um, and it's happening in Vancouver, Canada. We're in Canada. There's no tiger kings in Canada. There's not like wild insane farms of exotic animals and it is very regulated it's a different world um and it, and and it's funny because yeah describing the scene now there is no reason that i ever physically needed to be in the same place as this tiger it would be the heated film when you look at the blocking and how it's edited like we could have just split the screen on any shot we wanted with no problem we could have fixed anything with CG easily. Like, uh. And the problem was, though, we didn't really realize that till we were shooting it, and it just wasn't scheduled that way. Like, like while we were in the moment, we were like, oh, I don't actually need to be face-to-face -face with the tiger, but then we were like, we just didn't schedule the night in a way that we were shooting the tiger and then shooting me and shooting the tiger and then shooting me. So it was kind of just like, for time purposes, I have to be face to face with the tiger. So um, we had a phone call. Um, so that we, we hired a tiger guy named Randy who had a tiger. Um, and in the scene, in the script, it's very clearly described. I'm crawling through a field at night. We're shooting in Vancouver. I encounter a tiger. We're face to face. It runs at me. And that's, it kind of tackles me. That's the end of the scene. Um, the guy has had the scene for a few weeks. Um, and then a few weeks later, we were going to have a call to like go over the specifics of shooting as we like ramp up to shooting the scene, I think like the following week or something. Um, and so we talked to the guy and he's like, well, the, uh, the conversation went like pretty good for a little while. He explained like how the tiger will be and what it will be like. And then, and then the way I remember it is he was like, this isn't, uh, at night, is it? Yeah. They're like, yeah, the night sequence. I remember we went, oh. Oh. And we were like, is that bad? And he's like, well, tigers hunt at night. So they're more inherently <laughs> more aggressive at night. And he's like, it's not, uh, as long as it's not like in like a big open field in out in the wilderness, we should be okay. It's like we were, we're like in Squamish, which is like halfway to Whistler in the mountains. Yeah, in the forest, you know, specifically large open field. Yeah, we're like, you no, know, we're that's exact, literally exactly where we're filming the scene, a big open field. And he's like, oh, and he's like, as long as there's no like deer around, we should be okay. And we're like, there are, there are deer around. And he's like, oh, that's not good. And <laughs> and we're like, is it a big problem? And he's like, well, you know, they get 
they, you know, they, they might get it, start chasing the deer or something if they see it. But, I, but then he's like, but you know, it's fine. Honestly, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Don't worry about it. It's fine. He's like, as long as it, there's no chance that it'll be raining, it should be okay. And we're like, it will be. It probably will be raining. <laughs> um, we're in Vancouver. Rain yeah, we're like, we're in Vancouver. In We were shooting in December. We're like, it, it, yeah, it fucking rains. It's like 100 days straight at that time. <laughs> yeah, and he's like, oh, that's not good. And we're like, why? He's like, well, the rain, they don't like the rain. It just kind of agitates them and puts them in a bad mood. Um, but, but then the whole thing was... So it's like everything that could be not good for shooting is not good for shooting. But he's like, don't worry, I will double you. Like, um, and the conversation was like, you're, he was like 20 or 30 pounds bigger than I was. But the thought was like, he'll lose a little weight and he'll double me basically. So maybe I won't really have to do all that much with the actual tiger. Um, we show up to set that day and he looks absolutely nothing like me in any way shape or form like he literally can't fit in the wardrobe like he just he he he, he huh he's a different shaped man he just was a different shaped guy than i was like he was just and it was it was naive again another it was naive of us to think we would be the same shape ultimately i think like <laughs> hearing this all aloud this is a long string of bad bad choices we are the stupid ones in this story. So then it, when it becomes clear he can't double the t me, um, it becomes clear that the only option, it seems, is that I have to perform the scene with the tiger. And I remember that day, like in the morning, being like, I don't want to ever be near this fucking tiger. Like, I, I don't want to go near it. I don't want to be in the same, like, vicinity of it. I like... I'm remembering when they came over and they were like, Sessie, come yeah, he was like, now it's time for Seth to come over and meet the tiger. And I was like, okay, I guess I gotta go meet the fucking tiger now. And like, within a minute, I'm like, uh, like petting a fucking tiger, like playing with this fucking tiger that I do not want to be playing with. Um, we, we start shooting the scene. Um, and it's horrifying. <laughs> and you're also becoming very sick throughout the course of it. <laughs> he was like messed up for the rest of the shoot after that because he was in the mud and the rain. That was that was a pretty bad scenario. Yeah, it really was bad. And I remember, I think like the lowest moment for both us and the tiger is we were trying to get the tiger to roar, uh, and it wouldn't roar. And then the tiger trainer was like, "Give me a second. And he was wearing a glove, and he took off his glove, and he like. <laughs> He peed in it. He peed in his own glove. And then he went up to the lion and he kind of just like rubbed the pee glove on the lion's uh, or the tiger, the tiger's face. And the tiger, it didn't roar, but it kind of went like, ah, like it did exactly what a person would do if you rubbed a pissy glove on its face. It was just like, ah. and then, and then he turned to us and he was like, you'll add a roar noise in and post it. It'll, it'll look great. And what, maybe the most annoying thing is like, he couldn't have been more right. Like it, it was. <laughs> Man, I'm also remembering there were two tigers. He had the one that was well behaved and was hoping not to have to use the other one because it was more aggressive and he never did that. Part of me suspect no one saw that second tiger, and part of me suspects he did not have two tigers, and he charged us for two tigers. Interesting. He just walks in with the tigers, like, oh, here's the other one. Yeah, could be. Well, it was just like in a van in a cage. He kept like alluding to a second tiger. It's like, oh, I don't want to have to get the second tiger. And we were, I remember at one point being like, can you see the second tiger? He's like, no, you don't want to go near the second tiger. But it, I was like, and then I, at one point I was like, I don't think there is a fucking second tiger. I think this dude's charging us. He's up, char he's charging us for two tigers. He's got one tiger. That's the story to him. He's like, ever tell you about a time I double charged people for tigers? Um, but you will be happy to know that they have closed down. Um, he's been shut down. <laughs> And I actually donated money to a PETA campaign to help shut down his animal uh, sanctuary. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's a big regret. I'm glad that I'm glad it got shut down. In <laughs> hindsight, we should have like reported it. Like, there's a lot of things we could have done. I think that it was also like in just such shock from the whole experience. Tigers are crazy. There was a tiger. Yeah, I think when you're face to face with a tiger, everything kind of goes out the window. I 
like, I mean, I guess specifically to us, when we are face to face with Tiger, we make terrible decisions. <laughs> Um, another story, maybe a fun last story. Uh, I talk about, um, all of us going to the magic castle on way too many drugs and James Weaver participating in a magic show. That was, that was a grand evening. That was very fun. Yeah. It was, we were going into a magic show and everything. Explain the magic castle, uh, from your uh, magic castle is this famous place in LA and it's where like the world's best magicians will come to perform. Uh, and it's, a the, the, the building itself is kind of like a magic place. Like it's a nice old looking manor on a hillside, but it's actually built deep into the hills. So once you go in, it's got numerous theaters and there's big show theaters and medium ones and like close up ones and magicians are all over and there's fancy bars and you have to have a dinner and you have to come dressed in suits and uh, yeah. proper attire. And as before we went in, everyone was very drunk and high. Yeah, we were super but, high. But everyone just stayed back. You know, like, let's yeah, I remember. So yeah, we 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 we, we took like a company, kind of like a company retreat, not a retreat. One day uh, we all did drugs and went to the Magic Castle, um, and and uh, huh? It was just a bonding day to have fun. It was a bonding day, and and yeah, and they were kicking in strong, and I had been before, and I knew. Yeah, they asked people to volunteer, and James is a guy that we work with, and we told him like, don't. Yeah, we told everyone, like, don't volunteer. Like, you're too fucked up. Like, you'll ruin the shows. Just, like, don't volunteer. Don't put yourself in that position. You just don't, you don't want that, you know? Um, and we get inside, and right away, uh, someone walks up to James and he said... walked in, like, a few feet ahead of me. I, like, lost him for a moment, and then I walked in and saw him mid-conversation being like, yeah, I'd love to be on stage. <laughs> exactly. We walk in right away. So I was like, would you like to volunteer? He's like, yes, I would love to volunteer. <laughs> and then they just took him away. And I was like, no, what? what? I just told you not to volunteer. What the fuck? Um, and so we were waiting for a close-up magic show. Um, and, and, and so we file in, uh, to a very small theater, literally about the size of this room I'm sitting in. It, it holds maybe 25, um, audience members. And it's like, uh, kind of like a small amphitheater all centered around just like a table. And we come into the room and James is sitting at the table, <laughs> clearly like the centerpiece, uh, volunteer for this close up magic show we're about to watch. And he looks like a fucking crazy person. He's just like as, as high as a human can be basically, you know? Um, and we sit down in the theater and, the the magician comes out and he can tell James is high, but he can tell James is fucked up. He cannot tell he's high. And I think that it was like an older kind of seasoned ma magician who saw James and was like, this guy's drunk. I've dealt with a lot of drunk people in my career. I got this. Um, and then he, you, mostly what I think of is the magician realizing that this guy, like he was encountering someone that was fucked up in a way that he had never encountered before, basically. <laughs> like there were thousands of drunks, but this he was untrue how to handle it. And it was like, this was the guy that broke him. And he would be like, you could see he was like, pick a card from where, from here, which card, any card. Do I show you the card? No. Do I show them the card? Yes. Okay. Guys, it's the three of hearts. You're not supposed to say that out loud. Okay. Do I pick another card? Yes. What do I do with this card? Put it back. Do I remember this card? No. And this went up and you could see the magician be like, Oh no, like the, I, I, I have entered a situation where someone is so high, they don't know what the fuck is even happening right now. I was sitting with, uh, with, with our vice president of the company, Alex, and she kept way too loudly going, this is terrible magic. This is very bad, we should leave, this is awful. And I kept being like, your voice is, you, you can't be saying that, you just can't do that. She was like, I know, but this isn't good. <laughs> it was a real con I can't believe we got out of there. That kudos to like bravo to that magician. He yes, was masterful with it all. He was, and drugs and magic don't don't ultimately drugs and magic don't mix. I think because yeah, like it'd be a wonderful combo, but magic's too magical. Drugs are too drugs. 
<laughs> all you see is the deception, I think, also. Like, all of a sudden, you're like, this person is fooling me. That's all this is. You're trying to fuck with me, and I don't like it. <laughs> all that love and kindness, you're trying to trick me. <laughs> exactly. I came here for a show, and you're just trying to trick me. Um, I don't like it. Uh, okay, how's that? Is the Magic Castle still open? It is. I, I have no idea, honestly. And I think they were hit with some controversy <laughs> as well. <laughs> no, not like Hollywood. Magicians never do well. Exactly. Um, well, all right. Well, Thanks thank for joining us. <laughs> thank you, Seth. Thank you, Evan. Again, Seth Rogen's book is Yearbook, and it is available wherever books are sold.